Once a process is defined, a plan simply follows. A plan is just a little bit more tactile uh, version of the process. It actually shows you these are the things you're going to go after. These are the actual systems or, or networks uh, and usually puts timestamps around them or, or time frames around them, uh, puts days that you're going to be on site or off site, days you might need an auditor to follow you around if you're doing physical security audits and so forth. It actually scopes that out in a little bit more precise detail, puts a little bit of a tactile feel to it. Continuing the conversation a little bit about the authorization for the assessment and support for the assessment. These are, are key components that I find I will not actually start an assessment without. First of all, they have to be from an officer of the company or some type of uh, person that actually has the ability to authorize this. It doesn't just mean random IT person number 712 or, or uh, this manager or that director. It means it, it's quite possible that this random IT person or, or this first tier IT person does have the ability to authorize a, a penetration test, and that's fine. I just want to ensure that whoever signs this, whoever actually provides written authorization, is able to provide that kind of authorization. And usually I just start taking it up the chain to ensure that someone actually is properly authorized. Very, very often it's an officer of the company or someone that has a significant owner stake in the company. Those are the people that typically can sign for this. Depending on the business itself, the type of business and the process that the business follows, often this has to be someone on the board of directors or someone in a, a chief executive officer kind of role. Whatever it is, doesn't really matter to me as long as I've got the authorization. The trick here is not to begin any of this process before I have that in my hand. Otherwise, I may be violating the law. I may be violating their process. I'm certainly not not signing up for success in that case. And this sign off really needs to have a bunch of these things that I've got on this slide in place. First of all, they need to tell me that they are authorized to give me permission to do what is in this document. Obviously, if they're not authorized to tell me to do it, then then we go back to square one. So they're they're stating I am authorized to do this or authorized to authorize you. Essentially, I have permission to authorize you and I am authorizing you based on the scope that we've defined, the deliverables that we've defined. Uh, I am telling you that I'm not going to sue you for doing what I'm telling you to do. Um, it A lot of times that will come from an attorney or a uh, a, an insurance company that has a liability policy on you for this kind of work. Another one that's interesting, this fourth sub-bullet here, definition of who receives deliverables is really important up front because often when you get to senior management for authorization, they'll say something like, I want you to deliver your report to me and me alone, and I'll decide who gets it. And if that's the scope, that's great. But that means that you're not going to be giving your report to the IT staff. You're not going to be giving your report potentially to the person that's managing your engagement. And that's a little bit awkward. You should be prepared for that right up front to understand who gets this information and who doesn't. And it may feel very strange working with someone for days or weeks or months and then not giving them the report or being able to talk about it. But that's not your decision. At this point, you're making an agreement to deliver this stuff to whoever this person tells you to. And in most cases, it's a it's a case of I just want to look at it before you give it out to the rest of the folks or I want to hear your presentation before I before I authorize you to present it to the rest of the staff. And that's fine. But again, defining that up front is critical. I mentioned payment terms, understanding who gets to pay you and when they get to pay you based on your deliverables, who you should contact in case of emergency. I think I've covered that quite thoroughly. And defining when to use it, when to make that call, error on the side of calling, error on the side of don't calling. Uh, error, does this person actually know that there's a penetration test happening, that there's an ethical hack going on or not? That's a great piece to know as well. And if any kind of support is included, understanding who uh, is supporting you and how they're supporting you. For example, you may need uh, to get into the building on a daily basis. Who's going to get you into the building? Where are you going to sit? Or do you have to find your own place? Do you have to kind of, you know, social engineer yourself a cubicle? That may be part of the scope. That may not be. So defining based on what they're looking for, 
what support you're going to get and whom you're going to get it for is important to have up front. The last thing you want to do is show up and assume you're going to have a desk and a, a network tap and, and access, and you don't have any of that. The assumption was that you should get that on your own. Not good. And I am, as a disclaimer, not an attorney. I do not pretend to be an attorney, whether on video or in real life. But I do know that in most states, this these laws are going to vary. So you want to be really, really confident before you engage a customer with ethical hacking, with any kind of penetration, a test, test or assessment. You want to ensure that you consult with an attorney to make sure your rights are preserved, to make sure that you are excluded from liability and that you've got all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. It's usually worth the money. They're not inexpensive most of the time, but they are well, well worth it in terms of long-term liability or exposure. So you've got your plan, you've got your process, you've got an agreement signed and reviewed by an attorney and maybe revised and signed and all that stuff. And that can take days or weeks, sometimes months. And now it's time to actually do the security assessment to perform the test that you've learned about. Step number one, follow the plan. What the plan says and the scope says, you follow those to the letter. Never, never, never exceed the scope. And it is tempting. It's super, super, super tempting to start hacking systems that you find randomly or start, well, I think this system is probably vulnerable to ping of death. So I know I'm not actually supposed to bring any systems down or cause any havoc, but, you know, one ping of death won't hurt. Well, it will hurt, actually, and it, it's not a good thing. It's tempting as heck. You've got to stay away from exceeding scope. Document everything I've mentioned throughout a lot of these videos. I typically will just screen record or screen capture everything as well as taking notes, uh, building my nefarious network map, feeding the data I gather into other systems, uh, both for continuation of the penetration test as well as to ensure that I understand where I've been and can prove in a very conclusive way what I've done and what I haven't done. Those are great techniques. And ensuring that no disclosure happens outside of the written agreement. If I've agreed to only disclose my findings to person X, well, then person X is the only person I'm going to talk to. If I find a critical vulnerability uh, during my assessment and decide I've got to let them know immediately, this can't wait for days or weeks or months uh, for a formal report. They no need to know immediately that they should get on this, that they should patch this or do something. Well, again, that doesn't mean you should exceed the written agreement. You should definitely tell person X, maybe with a recommendation of, hey, I noticed that this router is configured this way. During my penetration test, I found that this this may be a problem and in fact is a well-documented attack vector. This is something that you probably don't want to wait to tell your staff to fix. And that's it. And they may refer you to the staff. They may take the information and send it to the staff. They may say, okay, keep quiet and keep going. But that kind of of adherence to the communication plan is absolutely crucial as well. Otherwise, you may actually devalue the entire process by telling the wrong person the wrong thing. They may have set up that particular vulnerability because previous uh, penetration tests didn't reveal things and they want to make sure you're doing your job. They want to make sure you're actually conducting the tests you say you're going to conduct. So they set that vulnerability up. It's not really an exposure. They've just kind of put it out there for you. And, oh, look, you found it. Great. We're real happy that you found it, but I don't want you to tell anybody else. Whatever that is, adhere to it.